things have gotten better, but there's still this mismatch between demand and supply, isn't there? Well, we, the effects of the COVID crisis certainly aren't over yet, and a lot of countries are uh, still experiencing uh, new lockdowns. Uh, so that'll keep uh, demand, uh, I think, uh, a bit soft. But we've had a clear recovery from the worst of times back in uh, April and May. And I'm uh, fairly hopeful that we're going to see uh, economic recovery out into 2021, and that should uh, begin to rebalance the markets. Adam, what we've really been seeing also through this whole uh, pandemic, through 2020, is that many of the trends that were there before have been accelerated, and one certainly may well be that oil demand does not re recover to levels that we saw in 2019. Uh, what, could, what, what can be done about that? And that's probably a good thing in some ways in terms of uh, the environment. Uh, tell us about what you've been doing there in terms of trying to get to the hydrocarbon industry to become more environmentally friendly. Well, let's, uh, let's think about those numbers just a second. Uh, CAPSARC's uh, own uh, oil supply and demand models say that we should get back to something like 96 million barrels a day by the, the, uh, this quarter. We could be uh, near 98 million barrels a day uh, by the end of uh, next year. And I think there's actually a fairly decent chance with both population growth and economic growth, particularly in Asia, that we might see 100 million barrels a day uh, by uh, the end of 2022. So that would get us back to where we were uh, at the start of uh, this year. Uh, what your question about what the industry is doing is, I think, actually a, a critical one. Uh, under the Saudi G20 presidency uh, here uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, energy ministers from all of the G20 countries and guests, including Singapore, uh, were uh, adopted something we call the circular carbon economy approach. And the idea is really pretty simple. It's to use uh, four clearly defined ways of dealing with carbon management, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove. Reduce are things like that we've done for a long time, renewables, wind and solar, efficiency, um, Recycle and reuse is find ways to use carbon dioxide as a uh, asset, a resource, really, and then remove. And that's going to be the critical one. Uh, the looking at the trends, uh, eighty percent of our energy around the world still comes from hydrocarbons. Uh, that is probably going to come down, but even in in the most aggressive renewables scenarios. There's still a lot of oil and gas being consumed in the world, and we've got to deal with the carbon dioxide. We've got to find ways to literally direct air capture, take it out of the air. We've got to stop it when it's uh, being burned. We've got to find ways to store it geologically or even biological recycling. So this is going to be a critical thing going forward. So what's the future of fossil fuels then, Adam? Well, I think uh, fossil fuels really uh, uh, still have uh, a lot of uh, opportunity ahead. Uh, what has to be done, of course, is to use those hydrocarbons in a way that doesn't damage the environment. And that's where investment and regulatory frameworks come in. We need governments. Uh, in fact, we should take advantage of the stimulus packages surrounding the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, to uh, really push hard on the technology associated with managing carbon. Uh, hydrogen, uh, I uh, you know, heard you talking about earlier, would be one of the key ways of thinking about that, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. Uh, we need uh, the technology associated with storing uh, carbon, recycling and reusing it, and, uh, and a global effort uh, to do that is going to be critical. Uh, biological approaches, geologic approaches, uh, literally using every tool in the toolbox to address the climate challenge. Adam, we talked about how the pandemic is impacting demand for oil. When the pandemic blows over, do you see shale growing again? Shale's biggest problem has really been uh, the combination of lower oil prices 
and the the difficulties in financing uh, that are occurring in the shale patch in the U.S. Just as an example, uh, getting uh, equity financing is almost impossible now in the oil area. Uh, availability of debt is limited. And with the low prices uh, that we have, cash flow uh, is not providing the same uh, level of support that it was earlier. So the rig count is down. I mean, I think that shale uh, always has the opportunity to improve the costs and the technology. And I don't think it's going to go away. Uh, but over the next year or two, uh, I think that it's not going to be nearly uh, the dominant force in the markets that it was in 2018 and 2019. Adam, just a quick word on your forecast for the oil price very quickly, but I then want you to move to when you think we're going to see peak oil, or have we already seen it? I think you've already answered that part of the question there. Well, the peak oil that people are talking about now is uh, peak demand, you know, the energy transition moving towards uh, non-hydrocarbon fuels. You know, and as I've said, I think that the, that uh, particular thesis uh, has a ways to go yet before it becomes real. I think that, that uh, quality of life still matters to a lot of people. There are some very hard to decarbonize sectors like aviation, shipping, steel, cement, um, petrochemicals, and so on. Uh, and technology can deal with the carbon associated with that, but you still are going to need those hydrocarbons. Uh, short run, um, I think that uh, that oil prices are below replacement costs now. This is the problem that you're seeing in the shale patch in the U.S. I think prices eventually are going to have to come up. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, if you just look at the bans associated with uh, trading, uh, I think at some point we're likely to see oil prices back up in the $60, $65 a barrel range, but that may take until 2022 before we get there. 